Yeah, my thoughts were a little muddled, I think, as I re- re- wrote my sermon today. So I had to get up early this morning and try and put them in, in, in a new order. And I hope it works. <laughs> There's not much insight that we have about the life of the early church. We don't know what it was for them to gather on that day after uh, the Sabbath, that, that Sunday morn, the Lord's Day. We don't know. We know that they went and continued their life within the synagogue with uh, the rhythm of prayer that was the, the life of the synagogue as Jewish uh, believers, but they added to it this other gathering, this sort of remembrance of the Lord's res- resurrection. We can learn something about their life uh, if we pat- patch together insights that we can glean from letters like the letter of Paul, Paul's letters to the Corinthians. <coughs> we learn some things about them there. Uh, we certainly understand the centrality of, of them re- remembering Christ through the gift of bread and of wine. But generally, we're not really aware of what too much, of what was in uh, their... Um, their life. You, I know, as a congregation, have uh, enjoyed um, the uh, TV series *The Chosen*, uh, with its kind of creative imagining of the backstory of all of the disciples and perhaps Jesus Himself. I've only seen a couple of early um, early episodes, and I got carried away with some French murder mysteries. <laughs> But there is in James's little epistle, that wonderful epistle that tries to sort of sort us all out to become people not just of the, of the talk, but of the walk, if you like. We see in James a little bit of a hint of what they were about as they gathered in worship. Are any of you, any among you suffering, he would say, well then pray. Are any of you joyful and cheerful, well sing. Are any of you among you sick? Then call the elders together and have them anoint you with with oil. And confess your sins and pray for one another and be healed. And if someone has wandered off from the path of the truth, then return them in, and we hope gently return them in, return them back to the right way. Hence you'll have covered a multitude of sins. We know that much about their life. We, of course, have kind of stylized some of that. You don't have to be cheerful, and now you're just made to sing, whether you like it or not. <laughs> we assume that if you walk in here miserable as, as sin itself, by the time you've finished the opening hymn, or maybe even the last hymn, you'll be sort of have a smile on your face. The psalmist gives us a hint of what could go on when they write that righteousness and peace should kiss each other. I thought, well, what if we turn to each other and as we pass the holy, holy kiss of peace, we kind of, you know, one cheek was peace and the other cheek was righteousness. Or maybe even better if within ourselves we could embrace ourselves and offer us the combination of peace and righteousness as part of our inner disposition. What a lovely thing that would be. One thing, however you look at it, one thing is really clear, and it's clear in James, actually, that there was sort of an intentionality, not a formality, but an intentionality of their worship. I think they first came and gathered together to offer worship to God. That was their intention, but it was also their intention to take care of one another and to bring to God the needs of one another and to share the life. So we wept with each other and we rejoiced with each other, just like we did last week. One way of describing what we managed to do last week in terms of that healing service if you're here, it was, it was to sort of be intentional. And so many of you came forward to be prayed for and to offer prayers for yourselves or prayers for others around you 
And it was a, it was a, it was a, a friend of mine said, uh, who I watched it online actually, she said, what a thank you for what a holy time that was. A holy time that conjured up in her her, her own offer of prayer, of things that perhaps that even took her by surprise. And she prayed with us, creating a holy time in her own living room. John adds that love also, just loving one another, and finding those ways to love covers a multitude of sins. Now we do know, as I say, the early church followed the Jewish year. They followed uh, the great festivals. They marked the great interactions of the people of, of Israel with God, the Exodus, the Passover in the Exodus, the residing in the wilderness, the gathering of the first fruits after the exile. And Christians developed their own patterns of, of church life from that rhythm that they had, had, they had acquired as Jewish, follow, as Jewish believers. For them, they, they, the, the Passover became the, 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 the passing over of, from life, from, from death to life of Jesus' own resurrection. And the first fruits, the gathering of the first fruits, became that period of time from when, Don, when, when Jesus resurrect, uh, ascended to the time when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Because the one thing that was very clear to them from the beginning, and he maybe didn't even understand how that was going to be, but it's right there in our gospel this morning, the very beginning of Mark's gospel, the first thing Mark wants to make clear to us is that this Jesus has not just come. Yes, we need to be, be turned to God and be forgiven of our sins and have sl the slate wiped clean, and righteousness is all about that, but... It's to receive something. It's to receive a new baptism that Jesus would bring into the world, which was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That we would never be left alone. I am with you always, he said to them as he ascended, just before he ascended. But how was that to be? It was because he would give, he would plunge all of those who followed him into this gift of the Spirit. So we bear the Holy Spirit of God from our baptism all the way through our life until we are, we are sort of become, our lives become the first fruits of, of the Spirit in whatever eternity is. The gift of Holy Spirit, we, we take these celebrations, we even, they even took the celebration from the pagan world of the turning of the world towards greater light from from the winter solstice to the time when the light began to expand in the course of the day in, in, the, Europea, in the Western European or Northern Hemisphere. And they took that celebration of that moment and said, here's when we celebrate the coming of God's light into the world. When we are sitting in darkness, a great light has come, says the prophet Isaiah, and we know that light was in Jesus, and so we celebrate. They, they took over that celebration of light and said, oh, this was when we mark the coming of Christ. And Lent celebrates our preparation, our time of preparation to get ready to be able to enter into the sufferings of the cross and the joy of the resurrection. And Advent is a time also to get ready to know that we are not in charge of the comings and goings in this world. The history has its beginning and history has its end. And all of that is wrapped up in the coming of Christ. And we mark it and we prepare ourselves for it in this period of time that we we call Advent. You know, when we complain that Christmas is becoming commercialized, I've begun to say to myself, well, it's just going back to its roots. It began pagan, and it's returning to pagan. <laughs> Doesn't mean we have to get carried, carried away with, with all of that. Yeah, we stand firm in the midst. We stand firm in the midst as people of intentionality, who celebrate and see something far deeper 
in the course of human life than just that which is a, appears on the surface. Advent's about waiting, it's about how the expectation of God acting, it's about angels talking to Elizabeth and John, it's about angels talking to Mary and then to Joseph, it's about heralding the coming of John the Baptist and heralding the coming of Christ. And that's like in John's message to us through Mark today, there is a secret in the midst of all this, that this Jesus who God promises brings us, pulls us into the life of God, whether we like it or not, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what is that? Well, it's, it's the beginning to look a lot like Christmas spirit. It really is. There's joy in it, and there's peace, and there's righteousness, and there's kindness, and there's long-suffering, and there's patience, and there's love. It's all of that Paul describes as fruit of the Holy Spirit within the life of a believer. But there's more. There's discernment, and there's ability to interpret the signs of the, of the world around us. There's a prophetic vision that's given through the Spirit. There's the gift of knowing, and there's a profound consciousness of being, a mindfulness, I suppose is the modern phrase. Needed, being needed to navigate this life in a way in which peace and righteousness can actually kiss each other. Those are the gifts of the Spirit as Paul describes them. So it's no insignificant matter this baptism that Jesus brings. It's what we inherit. Now, like you, I, I, and I'm saying at 8 o'clock, like Ted probably, when I read Isaiah 40, a little uh, tenor voice appears inside me. And when I'm talking about the comforting, I can hear myself bellowing out and soft, well, softly saying, you know, come me, my people. And then I get sort of a tenor and a bass and a baritone appears in me. The next thing you know, I'm yelling about the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all things, you know. And I'll jump to my feet when the Alleluia chorus happens. Just like King George II. The only king that could ever make all, can continue to make all Americans still stand at the monarch's becking or beckoning. Because that's why you stand in the Messiah when the Alleluia chorus comes on. It's, it's because that's what the king did in 1741 or something. I don't know when it was. But that's what he did. And so you all point, all you pop up, even all you Americans pop up and follow the king's bidding. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. <laughs> Great counselor, prince of peace. But in the midst of all that, I forget what's under my feet. As I'm thinking about the comfort and I'm thinking about the glory, I forget what's under my feet or what's under Isaiah's feet, the feet of the prophet that gave us these wonderful words. You see, the prophet stood in exile. The prophet stood on a destroyed Jerusalem to declare the comfort of God. He looked along roads that were broken and, 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 and un, unmade by war and neglect. The very symbol of God's presence, the temple itself, was no more. And suffering abounded among all the people among whom the words of comfort were being, to whom the words of comfort were being spoken, and the words of hope. Here with his feet deep in the rubble, he declared comfort, and God's infrastructure plan for new roads, flattening mountains and uncurving curves, and making every road straight and smooth so no one could be obstructed from coming into the presence of God that all could have access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords 
the maker of heaven and of earth. The one who made us in the divine image. And as one theologian I heard just yesterday uh, said, it wasn't so much that we are made in God's image, we're made in God's imagination. A much, much richer vision, richer picture, I think, than just that of image. And from that straight road, God's glory is revealed. God's word is made, is proclaimed as secure. God's promises are re received and assured. And we may come and go, but God and God's word remains forever. In other words, these words of the prophet thrust us into a perspective of this life that is way beyond this life, but yet encompasses it all and does not divorce us from the suffering and, and the imperfections that are around us, but kind of anchors us nevertheless, not in negativity and divisiveness, but in something beautiful and centered, with a vision that we are then to live unto and live with and share and comfort people with. It's a gift. It's a gift to have the Holy Spirit. It's a gift to have such a perspective, this deep looking into existence, an existence that all depends upon this beautiful imagination of the divine being. The imagination that builds all things new and that loves, that believes all things and experiences endures all things and hopes all things. This is the gift of the Spirit. This is why it's always beginning to look a lot like Christmas. It's what we bring into it. Recently I heard the Archbishop of Jerusalem talking with our own presiding bishop on a recording of an interview. And he said, looking over Gaza, where he as the Archbishop of the Christian Church at that point when he was talking had the only functioning hospital in the Gaza Strip at that time. And where there is, as he admitted, a very small community of Christians, but a very active community of Christians serving their population. He said, if you want to know how to let all these images weave their way into the Christmas season, he says, recognize first of all that the first Christmas was no picnic that there was displacement as people were forced to return to their places of birth. Can you imagine that? Go back to where you came from. That's exactly what the Romans said. That's what took Joseph and Mary on the road, going back to where they came from. In, when we did the census in Oxford, when I was, uh, that I remember in the 1970s, there was a census and it happened to fall on a Sunday morning and the college, uh, Numbers in the college almost doubled on the census because it was held on that Sunday morning with a lot of overnight visitors in the dorm rooms. We were counted as we slept, basically. But that didn't happen under the Romans. There was that army occupation. There was the slaughtering of innocent children under the age of two that Herod undertook. The Archbishop says, that's the story. That's the story. Yeah, we keep the innkeeper episode, no room at the inn. <coughs> but so much other suffering and chaos, we don't always remember that, the Archbishop says. But this year, you can avoid it. 
this year you can avoid it. And in its midst, we're to learn to speak comfort and joy and to practice peace. His only complaint was all was that don't make this an incident of further divisiveness among peoples in your protests of righteousness, so-called righteousness. But learn to speak comfort and joy. He called us, therefore, to a much more sober, serious advent as we take the scene of the rubble in our own day and still have the boldness to proclaim God's gift and God's promise. I always like it when, always taken anyway, by Mother Teresa's requirement that for her sisters to work directly with the dying, she said they had to acquire the charism of joy. They had to require the charism of joy. And so in pursuit of that, I thought I'd buy a book. So I book a book that was called The Book of Joy by Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, and you've seen the movie, or some of you have seen the movie as well. And I thought, well, a, work, a book will kind of, maybe that will get me to the charism of joy. <laughs> but no, that's not the thing. But there's a workbook that goes with the study. And in the workbook, all you have to do throughout the year is every day, write down three things that you're grateful for. In other words, if your attitude to life is one of awe, is one of great gratitude, if you learn to look at life that way, that becomes the sort of seedling out of which joy comes. That's the seedling out of which joy then comes. Gratitude and joy linked together like peace and righteousness. Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, and so he does. Each and every one of us, as we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we're anointed by the priest or the bishop and sealed as Christ's own forever and anointed with the Holy Spirit, Jesus gives this gift to each and every one of us who will turn to him and let him breathe on us. In the words of Peter, given that even this is how things shall be, what kind of people do we need to be? Let me say I believe it's to speak people who speak comfort to all around them people who live by a promise that will not fade, stacking your hopes and your promises on the word of God's assurance, people who let the glory of God captivate their eyes and be caught in their eyes, people who have hope even while standing on the rubble. People who, in the words of Mark, are the beginning of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, my friends, you, we, are the beginning of the good news of God in Jesus Christ because he has come. He did baptize, and he did it in the Holy Spirit that we possess and that possesses us. Amen.